Welcome back to another week on the Ask Pastor John podcast. Well, what future judgment will Christians face? The Apostle Paul, writing to a church of believers, said to them, quote, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 5.10. To Christians, he said that, and he included himself here too. We must all appear. In another place, he interrogated Christians by asking them, Why do you despise your brother? Despising other believers is ridiculous. Why? Quote, For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. End quote. Romans 14.10. Again, speaking of believers and including himself here, we will all. These pointed texts uh, arrest our attention and cause us to think about a future judgment to come for Christians. So no surprise, come loads of questions to us about these uh, and related texts, like this email from a listener named May. Pastor John, can you explain what kind of judgments Christians will face when Jesus returns? Well, let's start with the absolutely glorious news about the judgment that we will not face. Yes, amen. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. The, the accomplishment of Christ in dying for us and rising for us can be stated positively and negatively. Positively, he died to bring us to God, hmm. 1 Peter 3.18. The enjoyment of the presence of God forever is the positive achievement of the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. But the New Testament reminds us over and over again that we can state the good news negatively as well as positively. Namely, we do not come under the wrath of God. Mm. He achieved a negative thing. This is not going to happen. Christ bore our sins. We won't be punished for them. So John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has, that's now, has eternal, that's forever, life now. He does not come into judgment. Whoa. But has passed from death to life. What a verse. Hmm. That doesn't mean we don't go to court in the last day, it means we won't be condemned in court in the last day. We're already acquitted, and the court will prove it. Romans 8, 1, there is now and forever no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Or Romans eight thirty three, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. There will be no successful charge against us at the judgment. None. 1 John 3, 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life. So the judgment of wrath and punishment and final death are past. They're over for us. Jesus endured all of that for us if we are in Christ, if we are believing in him, united to him, his death was our death, his punishment was our punishment, God's wrath was exhausted on him toward us. Therefore, Paul exalts with the verse I go to sleep on almost every night, God has not destined us for wrath. Hmm. Sweet. But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we wake or sleep, we will live with him. <laughs> I love those two verses. Mm. Um, that's First Thessalonians 5, 9 and 10. So if there is a judgment that will not condemn Christians, what other kind of judgment is there for us? That's what's being asked, I think. There is a dimension to the judgment that does not call into question our eternal life, but determines what varieties of blessing or reward we will enjoy in the age to come. And I know this can be disturbing to some people because varieties of rewards sounds like some people are going to be happy and others are not. But it's plain from the Bible. There will be no unhappiness in heaven. None. No unhappiness in the age to come. Everyone 
will be as happy as he can be, all tears wiped away, in the presence of the all-satisfying God. But some people will evidently have greater capacities for happiness or greater avenues of happiness. Now, why do we think that? Why, why do we talk like that? We talk like that because the Bible teaches that we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we will be rewarded differently. Yet everybody will be perfectly happy. That's why we talk like that. Remember Jesus' parable? For example, the, uh, the king goes away and uh, then he returns and he gives different rewards to those who invested his money differently. The first servant came to him. This is Luke 19. The first servant came to him saying, Lord, your mina, now a mina is a uh, hundred drachmas and a drachma is about the price of a sheep. Your mina has made 10 minas more. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in very little. You shall have authority over 10 cities. And a second came to him saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, and you will be over five cities. Now that's a picture, I think, of differing rewards in the last day of how we stewarded our lives for Christ in this world. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, do not pronounce judgment before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. So the judgment will take into account our heart motivations, not just our outward deeds themselves. In Ephesians 6, 8, Paul says one of the most amazing things about the final judgment for believers. He says, whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or free. In other words, every single large or tiny good thing you have ever done as a Christian, whether any other human knows about it or not, will come back to you for good at the last day. Whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord. What a great incentive not to worry about who sees us, right, in what we do or what rewards we get in this life. Everything's written down, and God will make sure that any good deed we've ever done, seen or unseen, will be properly rewarded. Then in 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And that last word, evil, makes, whoa, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. the, the new question that text raises is, what does Paul mean when he talks about us receiving what is due for evil things we've done? Now, if, if our sins are forgiven, which they are, and we're acquitted in the court of heaven, which we are, does this mean there'll be punishment to Christians for sins they've done? That doesn't make sense, right? No, it doesn't mean that. I think Paul explains what he means in 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15. Very familiar text, but let me suggest this angle on it. No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day, that is the day of judgment, will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, 
he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So what I think Paul meant when he said in 2 Corinthians 5, each one will receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil, what he meant was that the way one receives evil is by having his bad deeds burned up, meaning he loses the reward he would have received if he had acted otherwise. Hmm. This is not viewed by Paul as punishment, but as loss of reward. It's not owing to God's wrath against his child. Mark that. It's not owing to God's wrath against his child. It is simply a fact that it would be unfitting for God to reward the sins of his children. They know that. We know that. Paul knew that. And they will not, true Christians, now mark this, true Christians, when that happens, when, when some of their life is burned up because it was worthless, when, when that happens, true Christians will not begrudge God for this loss. They will rejoice in the grace that they do receive, and their cup of blessing will be full. So, that's my sketch of the coming judgment. We will not enter into condemnation or punishment, but we will receive varieties of blessing, varieties of reward, different avenues of joy, different sizes of cups, but every cup full. Thank you, Pastor John. Yeah, First Thessalonians 5, verses 9 to 10, mentioned earlier in this episode. It's such a sobering bedtime prayer, and it's one of uh, Pastor John's essential Bible texts to memorize uh, because of how useful it is, and not only for, for bedtime, but for all of life and ministry. And that text is included in the APJ book on the essential Bible text for life's hardest battles, which you can see on pages uh, 44 to 46. Also there, you can see more on why rewards in heaven are unevenly given out. Uh, on pages 363 to 364, that goes deeper into what Pastor John has said here about 2 Corinthians 5.10 and 1 Corinthians 3, verses 14 and 15, all illuminating the depth of the APJ podcast archive, which you can find at askpastorjohn.com, every episode with audio and full transcripts available for you. Well, when are B's good enough? When are good grades good enough? A great question from a student all about our perfectionist tendencies and its drawbacks. That's up next. I'm Tony Ranke. We'll see you on Thursday.